Hello, welcome to Insights, everyone. I'm Nam De Odipo, and I'll be doing these alone without my usual companion and co-presenter, Elizabeth Omori. We will be discussing local government autonomy, ideal versus reality. I do also have an interesting guest for you uh, who is currently engrossed in the drive to creating a more friendly environment for persons living with disabilities in Nigeria. Uh, let's begin. My first set of guests are two gentlemen from Kano, and they will be giving us some insight into local government administration, the ideals in terms of functions as against what is currently obtainable, and how local councils are managing to influence development at the grassroots. Council Chairman Ngogo, local government area of Kano State, um, his name is um, Abdullah Galba Ramat, and my other guest is Abibu Sali. Melimu, a former local government council chairman. He is, however, currently the special advisor to the county state governor on IGL. First, let me welcome you, Mr. Chairman, to Insight. Okay, thank you very much. And Honorable, welcome also to Insight. Uh, we can't hear you, but I guess you've um, responded. I I'd like to begin with you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having me. Uh, th thank you so much for, for coming on the program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to begin with you. And um, as I'm sure you're aware of the president's major consent on local government administration and the executive order signed May last year, granting outright financial autonomy to the judiciary, uh, legislature, as well as the local government councils as the third tier of government. But tell me something, how has that played out for you and your council area, knowing that, that most APC state okay. governors especially, um, especially have agreed in principle to implement the order? Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, uh, uh, actually, uh, we all know that uh, giving autonomy is very, very important. And uh, attaining the uh, financial independence in the local government level will really help more especially, you know, uh, boosting the progress of the uh, government, more especially at the grassroots, that is the local government level. But uh, uh, it is one thing to have an autonomy, you know, and it's another thing to, to have a, a monitoring, you understand, uh, giving autonomy because uh, the autonomy was there before. We believe that, yeah, it was there before. But now when you look at the progress attained, by the local government, the chairman, I mean the former local government chairman, who enjoyed the autonomy. There's nothing, I mean, I'm sorry to say, there's nothing to write home about. So, so even if we are given a, a autonomy, even if the government is going to give us autonomy, I propose in the interim that there has to be a regulatory or a monitoring, a watchdog agency, somehow, somewhere, that would be uh, like, like watching the affairs of the local government and how this point is going to be, uh, uh, you know, judiciously spent for the benefit of the masses with palliative measure for the poor. So, Chairman, um, in, in spite of existing monitoring and evaluation mechanisms being put in place, you, you appear to think there should be more accountability. Uh, so just so that we, we monitor what local government administrations, especially the ones who already have autonomy to operate and, at, uh, and have the discretion on how or what projects and um, development projects to, to implement at their level um, should implement. I mean, you are now calling for more transparency in the process and more accountability. Am I, did I get you right? Yeah, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here uh, is that in a more clear and broader, broader term, I mean, um, you see, it's only uh, we people at the local government that knows exactly how local government is being run. Uh, you know, don't expect the local government to be just like a federal government or like a state government. Uh, there are uh, this thing, uh, you know, when we talk about due process, Mm. The due process in the local government level is quite weaker compared to the due process at the state government level. Oh. The way we are running the local government. You know, when you give uh, autonomy, let's say, okay, to state government, as they have it now, there are a lot of mechanisms that they can be used in order to have a proper accountability of what is being given to them. But we at the local government level, what I'm saying is that it's good to be given an autonomy. But even if we are given an autonomy, there has to be a mechanism that will watch or that will direct us or will monitor and control the way we will be spending this money. Uh, let me give you this example. Please. There are so many local government chairmen within, uh, uh, you know, around Nigeria. Uh, 
you know, some of the government chairman, they are new into the systems. But it's hardly to see a governor without an experience, administrative experience. But for the local government chairman, some of us, they don't have the experience of, uh, you know, administration. You understand what I'm, I'm trying to say? And the level of the due process at the local government is quite weak. So all I'm trying to say here is that if we are giving autonomy, there has to be a monitoring agency. There has to be something that, will, you know, just a strategy or a mechanism that will allow us or that will watch what the money is being uh, used for. Um, let me move over to Honorable Abibu. Uh, um, I, I guess, you, of course, you've been listening to Mr. Chairman talk about um, autonomy, but autonomy accompanied with some sort of of a um, monitoring mechanism. I, I guess it means, um, uh, aside from um, agencies like the EFCC, ICPC, of course, um, the media, the, the press, and there's also the, the, the people as well. These are all agents of, um, of monitoring and evaluation of uh, the activities of local government councils. But do you concur with Mr. Chairman's um, line of reasoning, um, Honorable Abibo? Well, uh, I think uh, what the chairman is trying to see, per se, is that there is a need for an established institution. For example, there is a proposal for the local government service commission okay. that should independently regulate, you understand, and also uh, where, unlike uh, the Ministry for Local Government, the, the local government commission will now be independent, just like uh, you have a National Assembly Commission and what are you? They will take charge of uh, both the responsibility of recruiting, uh, assigning responsibility to the staff that will now serve as supporting staff to the chairman, and those that will guide the policy guideline of whatever local government. And I think uh, a chairman is right in that direction. Okay. Uh, going by the experiences we have before, it always depends on when you have uh, a local government chairman who is uh seasoned in terms of administration and what are you will be the only one that can go into the books and make sure that he does things right where you have local government chairman that do not have what it takes uh, probably to be there other than just the political strength either to do the good father or what are you you end up having a local government chairman that is at all time confused Mm. Not knowing direct what to do, taking directors, he has to look for somewhere to take directors from. I, I, I and when you pick your, I, I'd an like to pick your brain, a very, a very based stable on your experience as a former council, local government service council boss, that one can guide him properly. Yeah. Okay, great. I, I'd like to, you know, just take up from where you stopped and pick on and pick on your experience as, as a former uh, council boss. And knowing that the functions and status of local governments in Nigeria have been state dominated for decades. Uh, can you speak to the relevance or the issue of relevance and how important it is for local government councils to enjoy substantial autonomy, to perform an array of functions and plans, perhaps formulate and execute its own policies, programs and projects, and also its own rules and regulations as, de as, as, as deemed fit for, for especially local needs? There is no doubt about the imperativeness you understand, for both uh, financial autonomy of the local government. The, the, there is no questions about the need for the local government to have, you understand, that independence. You understand? Mm. And I think uh, even, even when local government were asked actually to pass through the state for them to be able to do things, probably at, at that particular time, it was done out of the wisdom and the context and the situation at that particular given time. Now, the local government council have come to stay. Uh, they have been there. They have passed through stages. People can be able to now understand why the initial decision was taken. And also, there is apparent need now, because there are so many uh, experienced people now buying for the local government. There are so many people now that can learn from the problem of the fact, you understand, and those that can also act within the book. So, so there is no better time for the local government to enjoy their own autonomy than now, uh, by taking even the cognitions of the, the, the economic terrain of the country, you understand? Uh, let me give you an example. Very quickly. Uh, in, a, in other states, even the local government is doing something that is quite unique, you understand? But also the, the, the burden, you understand, also of certain things that need to be done. 
you understand, goes to the state. That's why you see local government employ more staff that they don't need. Mm. You understand me from the state. So they don't even have, you understand, the, 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 the ability to know when to employ one, not two. You understand? And that is why you see most of them are having the problem of paying salaries or even the chunk amount of the money goes to salary. Let me give you a sad example uh, with my own local government as a then. Okay. Uh, my salary package for the local government alone is weighing over 147 million as at the time I leave office. And that was the same amount I inherited when I was when I came on board. You understand? And at that time there was a recess. You understand? And uh, my own local government ended up receiving far less than a hundred million as a as a, as the as the, the allocation from the federation account. You understand? And if not because of a certain arrangement that the state governor comes off with a certain time, where all the local government and the state government will agree to work together, where we have less in terms of uh, uh, the allocation, the state will come in and balance off to pay the salary. You understand what I'm saying? And, and it goes for more than 10 to 15 months. You understand? And where the state government come in to pay the balance of the salary that I'm supposed to pay to my local government workers, I, I don't think I have any moral right to now go back to the state and say, oh yeah, give me more money to do this or do that. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, but I, I if, guess if, I... if, if, if the local government were completely independent, yes. it means I have to I have to think out of the box. Exactly. I have to now come up with the with the strategy either to move or reduce the staff if if, the, if that is what is necessary for the survival of the local government. Exactly. Or to come up with whatever I know necessary for me to be able to make sure that the local government runs. Or maybe I will have to now fight in all those places where the local government revenue, you understand, uh, actually I hide or I couldn't get my hand on it. Yeah. But you see, uh, this, is, this is what we are saying. The local governments now need this autonomy, you understand, for it to actually not only survive, mm -hmm. but for it to actually get it comprehends the even the situation they are into. And now that is when they cannot come up with the priority policies that will be able to solve their own peculiar problems and be able also to move forward. I mean, that's, and, uh, that's, that's, all, being said that's also, all good and proper. This point, I mean, you've, okay, you've, just, no you've just hit the nail on the head <laughs> because that's the course <laughs> of the issue for, for us. I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Honorable yes. Abibu have just described the scenario. But... And I don't know what your experience is as a, as a sitting um, council chairman right now, but I do need a frank answer from, from you to my rather blunt, and I'll be honest with you, blunt question. Do you okay. honestly feel in charge of your council affairs as an elected official and the head of a level of government for, or sometimes you feel uncertain because of some events and you feel unsure of that position? I see, um, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> Uh, being that uh, as a leader or as a leader of the house, you understand what I'm saying? Let's take an example now. As a leader of the house, being that someone is helping you or someone is like uh, giving you an obstacle in your own house, you understand? That does not mean you cannot feel as a leader of the house. Yes, of course, we are a leader of the house. I feel as a boss of my council. But, but not to send in, yes, I have an obstacle. I have a problem. Uh, lack of uh, financial autonomy, it is, of course, a problem. But let me take it from where my, my, my brother, you know, the Honorable uh, Stop. You see, based on his experience, what he was narrating, even if we have an autonomy, that would not serve as elixir to the problem we are having in the local government. It, because even if you have an autonomy, uh, think about the situation when you have an autonomy, you have all the, you, know, you understand, but you cannot be able to pay your salary from what you are getting from the uh, federal government. Me, from what I'm thinking, it's not only having, a, you know, the, the, the independence uh, based on autonomy, we have to ha have an independent mindset. First, okay. start thinking outside the box. How do we stand on our own? How do we reach a financial independency? We cannot put all our egg in one basket. But what understand? is stopping you, Mr. Chairman? It, it, is any, the law empowers you to think outside of the box. 
Yes, we are thinking, but 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 because because most of our uh, people, in, you understand, most of our chairman, they are only dependent on what is coming from the federal government. So we, as a local government chairman, like in my own government, we are thinking outside the box and we think like an entrepreneur. We are trying to establish a financial independence of our own. We are trying to let to let whatever coming from the federal government to be like a bonus to us. By by making a strategy, uh, you know, a, a developing a tactics so that we can be able to be generating an income through tax, you know, through uh, you understand through some strategy so that we can be like financially independent in our, our local government. So, so whatever is coming from the uh, federal government will only be an an additive, like I said before, like a bonus to us. So this is exactly what we are trying to do in my own local government because, like what my brother said, even if we have the autonomy some of our local government cannot be able to pay salary and we have not only his local government we have a lot of local government in kano that their quota their allocation the grants coming to them cannot be able to even pay their salary not talk of you know making a project for uh for their people so, so so in this regard even if we are having an autonomy let's start thinking outside the box okay. let's start Thinking anything, you know, even the state government now, the state government now, they are proposing this thing. They are moving from the, uh, thinking that, okay, federal government will give them this and that, and that they are going to use it for, for, for you know, for project and, and what have you. They are thinking of anything that will make them sustain the state, even without an intervention of the federal government. And this is exactly what my proposal is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to stay with you, Mr. Chairman, and talk about grassroots um, development. The, the present okay. local government system is operated from uh, the original concept enunciated during the colonial era of utilizing the government or at the grassroots for maintenance of law and order. And of course, the provision of basic uh, amenities as well. I know that Section 7 of the 1999 Constitution clearly spells out the functions of the local government. But can you use your administration as a case study and tell me to what extent you have been able to carry out your constitutional duties to the people of your council area? And what, what you've mentioned the issue of funding, I know, but are there other major impediments yeah. to doing more as you would have hoped to achieve? Uh, you know, exactly, of course. If I have an autonomy, I will do better than uh, what I, we are able to do now. Uh, you see, and we in Kano State, we have something like, uh, basically, it's, it, I can call it a minor autonomy. Because in uh, Kano State now, uh, during this administration, what we are doing now is that, uh, you know, whatever comes into our joint accounts, so we will be led to see how much we are spending. And at the end of every month, there will be a you know, joint account meeting where we will see how much did you spend and how much is left for you. So whatever is left with that local government would be given to the local government to execute a project of its own. So, but the problem we are facing is that, just like what uh, Horrible says, there are some local government in Kano State that their grant cannot be able to even pay off their salary of their staff. Mm -hmm. So such local government, uh, from the joint accounts, our money of, uh, like my local government now, we have the we have money in access. We are able to pay our our staff the salary. So whatever is remaining from the, our local government and other local government will be joined together to pay up the salary of the other local government that are not able to pay up their salary. So you see, this is exactly a problem to us because had it been we are independent, had it been you know, we have our money coming into our account directly. Those local government who have more staff, who cannot be able to pay off their salary, must sit down and think of other way possible. That can, you know, let them generate, either generate more income, you know, to pay off their salary and more income to execute their project. But because of this joint account, this joint account is only the problem that we are having here in Canada. Um, uh, let me just quickly move over to uh, Honorable Abibo. Um, before and in fact, in most cases still, um, state governments across Nigeria view local council, uh, councils as mere appendages to the second tier, tier structure. Uh, President Mohamed Buhari recently reminded, and this is just in response you know, to what Mr. Chairman just read, President Mohamed Buhari reminded local government chairman that, um, um, that if they allow this spending spree to go on, I mean, that they will take responsibility. 
And, and that means that local government council bosses would have to account for every kobo allocated to their local councils. Do you see that threat changing the narrative with council chairmen standing up to governors? And interestingly, I wonder how that will play out or happen in states where, um, where they do not have elected officials, but rather appointed caretaker committees. Well, uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to respond to this same question. Uh, uh, you see, me, the way I'm looking at uh, that instruction from the Mr. President, I'm looking at it as, uh, you know, it's, it's like you have, it's a situation whereby you have the ability, you understand, you have the weapon at your own hand, and your son is fighting someone outside. And instead for you to use the weapon, and stop the other person that is fighting your own son. You understand what I'm trying to say. But you are telling your son that you must fight him. Otherwise, if you do not fight him, when you come back home, I will fight you, my own son. You understand what I'm trying to say. If the federal government is really sincere with what they are saying, they should come down to the level of local government. And there are so many uh, power and authoritative, you know, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, power at their own hand. They can just direct the state government. Let us the, let there be no joint account. Simple. If, 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 if the uh, the presidency or the president say, let there be no joint account. Let each and every local government of Nigeria has it its own share of the you understand of, of, of the grant coming directly into this account. I doubt much if there's anybody in this uh, Nigeria. That will stop that from happening. But uh, to be sincere with ourselves and frank, why would you just be asking us to go and start fighting for our own self when you have every mechanism, every power at your own hand? At a blink of an eye, he can give an insurrection, he can give this directive, and it will be implemented right there and then. Yeah, yeah, I think um, uh, I just want to put it this way. Uh, if you look at it, uh, both the presidency and the state government are actually uh, uh, playing within a particular limit of the law. Exactly. In the, sun. Uh, uh, because, the Constitution well, clearly, uh, the Constitution clearly is what gives rise to the creation of the joint account. And uh, until that uh, particular aspect of the Constitution is completely expunged, the state will continue to hold on to it, you understand, to be able to see what they can do out of it. And so also the chair, the, the presidency is now using uh, its own power also and directories to come up with other uh, ways of compelling the local government to live up to uh, a particular expectation and what have you. And I think that the two, uh, to me, what is happening is a healthy development, actually, because it has never uh, happened before. And I think that will allow for, for a middle ground as to what one needs to do, you understand, for the local government to truly get that autonomy and that they should not have a questionable autonomy where certain state government can be able to go back and challenge one particular decision that was taken. Mr. Chairman, if you're still there, can you hear me? Um, I know how seriously local government councils take their economic responsibilities, uh, like um, connection, uh, collection, I beg your pardon, of uh, tenement rates and control of outdoor advertising licenses, for instance. But uh, tell me about yeah. other core responsibilities, like the provision and maintenance of, um, say, rural roads, um, public conveniences, um, sewage and waste um, disposal. Yeah. How has that been yeah, working yeah. out in your local government area in spite of all of the challenges of um, funding? <laughs> You, you, um, well, uh, you know, uh, from my own local government, like I said before, uh, right from the beginning, uh, I mean, I have uh, this uh, mentality in my mind that, uh, that I cannot just uh, sit down there and be expecting or uh, what comes from the federal government as the only solution to my people. Mm -hmm. So when I come in was a lack of uh, the autonomy and was a positive of fun everywhere at every uh, tier or level of the government. When I come in, I look at uh, our local government, you know, as a whole, and uh, I think what we are doing is that we are employing technology in collecting our tax. Before the manual collection of tax, you send people, they will go and, uh, you know, and collect tax manually using a manual receipt, and there are leakages everywhere. So when I come in, 
what I did is that I devised a tech chemist. We got a machine, a machine like a POS, and we programmed the machine. So our task collection now in Nungogo local government is an e-task collection. So we follow each and every, uh, you, you, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, taxpayer, and when they are paying, they are paying directly into our machine, and that allows us for more accountability. And when you are collecting a task from from uh, a taxpayer, if he or she knows that there are transparency in the way you are collecting the tax, and there's no leakages along the channel. So they will have more confidence and more trust in the systems, and they will pay up their tax. So this increases rapidly the way we are collecting our tax and the number of, you know, the point that we are, uh, are making. A yearly. And, and when you look at these are just examples of how you're thinking outside we, of the uh, box it, it, and being creative without to increase revenue for your local government. And these are great it, ideas. Exactly I actually you applaud doing. you for because uh, for going and listen. thinking outside of the box to increase a revenue drive. But very quickly, we've allowed them, honorable Abibu, to 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 be calm for a bit. But let me quickly come to you, honorable Abibu. Um, we, we've talked about thinking outside of the box, just, just so we can um, increase uh, revenue drive within local government areas. Considering that this is the this is the closest um, tier of government to the people at the grassroots, and their needs are peculiar sometimes, and their needs could also be much. How do we go about it so that um, uh, local government councils do not rely solely on federal allocations alone, but, you know, uh, think outside of the box, like uh, Mr. Chairman uh, just stated a couple of um, um, seconds ago, and increase revenue drive to meet their, their demands, their, their needs? For any serious local government chairman, he knows that now it's no longer a business as usual. You understand? Time for you to wait for something from the federation account is no longer bossy. You understand? One has to look at the peculiarities of his own environment, actually work through to get uh, to make sure that people pay the right tax right the right time. And uh, I think I can go when I was the chairman, we did that. Uh, we have to have to establish uh, revenue marshals and several other ways to come up with more revenue for our own local government. And we also create an interface with a lot of other agencies that help us avail us and available resources with them for the development of our own local uh, communities. I, I work with uh, NGOs, I work with whoever you know has a grant meant for the development of either people or a particular project. You understand? I go there myself and I make sure that I bring that one to my own local government. But what I want to also stress here is that uh, the, 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 the autonomy will also help us to think better and broader. You understand? Uh, in this aspect, because your reality will be before you. Mm. Where you where you are being babysitted by your own governor, you understand, uh, if that bill is removed, you will know that you have to be the man of the house and you have to live up to that particular expectation. I, you, I read that you clear. In. I read you clear and loud. Honorable, unfortunately, we're, we're totally out of time. Yeah, it's been a, a very interesting conversation having um, both of you, um, gentlemen, uh, from Kano, you know, uh, engage and give us insight into local government administration, uh, the ideals as opposed to what is truly obtainable on the ground. I want to wish you uh, both, um, both luck in your endeavors. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program. Council Chairman, Ngogo Local Government Area of Kano State, and Jina Abdullah Gauba Ramat, and my and um, Honorable Abibo Saleh Mel. Um, Lemo, I want to, former council chairman, of course, and current special advisor to the Kano State Governor on internally generated revenue. I want, to th I, want to, I, I want to thank you so much for both coming on the program. Thank, thank you very you much. much. Uh, moving on, my next guest will give us some insight into current efforts by the federal government to create a more friendly environment for persons with disabilities in Nigeria. He is the Executive Secretary of the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities, James Lalu. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank you. Thank you too very much. And arising from the peculiarity of this segment, we have a signed language interpreter. With two of them, as a matter of fact, in the studio with us. Well, you can only see one on your screen. His name is Timothy Tinat. Uh, I would like to welcome both of you and thank you for your participation on the program. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Mr. Executive Secretary, well, I'm going to be calling you from time to time, yes, for short. For, for so long, it will seem uh, like... No problem, um, no problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it will seem like your constituency, and by that, I mean millions of persons with disability in Nigeria, who, who by the way, constitute a large chunk of our population, were not accorded what is globally conceived as rights and privileges of persons with disability. But uh, let me ask you a personal question, which I hope um, captures or will capture and reflect the response of other members of your community or our communities with disabilities. Uh, what did the 2019 signing of the Discrimination Against Persons with, um, with Disability Prohibition Act of 2008 uh, mean to you in terms of the struggle for social inclusion uh, and also coming after nine years of relentless advocacy for disability rights, uh, for disability rights by, by groups and activists in the country. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> First and foremost, I want to make a little observation from your questions. Well, we say the struggle from the disability community is not only nine years, so it is 19 years. Ooh. It took us 19 years. <laughs> Till the day His Excellency President Mamadou Baru signed that this discrimination against persons with disability prohibition bid into an act. I want to tell you something about this. It was a welcome development in the disability community entirely when this act was signed. If you can look at it, over 31.5 million Nigerians with disabilities are there in this country, located in all the 774 local governments. And in all of the 8,845 electoral votes in Nigeria, persons with disabilities are everywhere. There is no family, nuclear or extended, that today can claim that they do not have any person with disability in their family. It is not true. Mm. So going by this, the signing of that disability act in Tulu by President Mamadou Buhari is a clear indication that the government today has become responsible to the plight of persons with disability. That is why we say that since the amalgamation of Nigeria since 1914, we have never had any president again except President Mamadou Buhari. <laughs> this goes to show the love. And the passion this president has demonstrated for the plight of persons with disabilities that made him to sign this bill into an act mm. and still go ahead to establish the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. He has finished his own work completely by mm. establishing this commission. He has given the key to us, the disability community, to navigate the political terrain in Nigeria, to navigate also the governance terrain in Nigeria to solve our own problems. That is why, by the grace of God today, I am here as the executive Secretary of the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. There are many of the persons with disabilities at director level down, and very soon when we do employment, mm. about 60% of the employment is supposed to go for persons with disabilities in Nigeria. So the ownership of the commission today is in the right and in the hands of the disability community. Mm. So That's... bringing out this bill, bringing out this law, Today, the criminalizes discrimination against persons with disabilities is the best thing ever to have happened to the disability community in Nigeria. Mm. It has bring us today at the same level with the global disability community, bringing about when you talk about the United States, you mm. talk about the remaining countries, you go to Asia, you go to Europe. Many of them are having institutions that cater for the rights and dignity of persons with disabilities. Today we have it. So the, the law in Nigeria is a replica of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which prevent discrimination against persons with disabilities. So it is a thing of joy to the disability community. Thank you. It, that, that's, that's good to hear, actually. That's good <coughs> news. I, I noticed that the mandate of the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities is quite vast. Uh, covering um, uh, the education, health care, and other social and economic rights of um, people with disability contained in the 1999 Constitution, as well as um, uh, the law on the rights of persons with disability. Uh, give me an idea of how you hope to accomplish some of these tasks that you've set for yourself and ultimately change public perception of persons with disability. Uh, 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 having, I mean, that they are not just being helpless, but rather that they are productive members of the larger society. <clears throat> Thank you so very much. 
When we say about when we say about educating the entire society about the rights and privileges of persons with disabilities, one thing that we want everybody today in Nigeria and beyond to understand that disability is a mere condition. Yes. Disability is a condition. It is an it is an interaction between the person with impairment and the environment. The environment here demonstrates the society itself. Therefore, one thing here is the attitude of the people in the society. Once that attitude is a negative, it brings about the condition which causes a disability to the person with impairment. Mm. Therefore, one thing that we want everybody to understand is that when you see a person like me today, I am not hearing. You can see somebody on wheelchair. You can see somebody who is blind. We are not condemned. We are persons with certain abilities in us, and there are things that we can be able to do. Therefore, if you can only understand it and come closer to the disability community, you will understand. The enormity, the enormity contained in the disability act today in Nigeria is a greater responsibility. As you rightly said, it touches on education, yes. health, economic advancement, and other certain areas. What in here I can tell you is that we are not trying. What we are saying is that we are we have already started okay. and we are on the train. We are moving. We are here today. We want to appreciate also the maximum support we are receiving from the Honorable Minister, Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. This is a woman that gives us all the maximum support to initiate and start a federal institution like this from the scratch. Mm. It is not an easy thing with a proper support. So when you look at this, in the area of education, what we are doing right now is to ensure that we increase the enrollment of children with disabilities to our own schools. Okay. The first thing that we are supposed to do is to make this school to be very, very attractive. So the persons with disabilities will find it att attractive to go to school. So our effort touches on making accessibility to the environment, the school buildings, amending the school buildings, and providing the necessary educational materials and other assistive devices. Our partnership with the Universal Basic Education Commission is to ensure that we make schools at the basic education level comfortable, accessible, and attractive. To persons with disabilities. So in this case here, yeah, when we look into this, we are working already with them to make sure that we achieve this. In the tertiary level, we are making effort to reach out to the third fund, tertiary education tourist fund, in the Federal Ministry for Education. We are having a meeting very soon with the Federal Ministry for Education to discuss about this. Okay. And we are going to bring all these bodies. You see, the Nigeria Colleges of National Colleges of Education Commission, and then we have also the NAPTEC and all other regulatory agencies, we are going to meet them. Again, we are developing some new courses that will accommodate interests of persons with disabilities so that these things can be taught. Uh, creating the necessary awareness about disability, we have to touch the tertiary institutions. These are where our intelligent people are coming from. Mm. These are where our brilliant, well-trained technicians are coming from. We have to make sure that we start the orientation from the tertiary institutions. So in this case, we are developing a new course today, working with professors from different, different units universities so that we can be able to develop this course then we will present the same course to the Nigeria University Commission for certain approval so that this course will be introduced in the tertiary institutions where the necessary awareness must start. Discrimination against persons with disabilities today is a criminal offense and therefore we need as a responsibility and as a responsible organization before us to create a necessary awareness. The National Orientation Agency and the Federal Ministry for Information mm. are bringing the necessary support. They are also belting up to also support our effort in creating the necessary awareness. I will use this opportunity to call yeah, on NTA uh, I, I, to also open their doors as well so that together we can create the necessary awareness. On the area of health, in the area of healthcare management, yeah. there are a lot of persons with disabilities today who need daily, regular,
national health attention. And in this way, we feel and believe that the national health insurance scheme, which we have already started in partnership with the National Health Insurance Agency, we have already started this partnership with them. Our partnership is to make sure that we provide a health care insurance program for hundreds of thousands of persons with disabilities across Nigeria. Uh, two things quickly. Um, uh, Executive Secretary, um, first uh, I'd like to assure you that uh, part of what we're doing here is um, our social responsibility and of course um, I, I know the NTA will be willing to work with you to create um, a sensitization and awareness, <coughs> raise um, public awareness and consciousness um, amongst Nigerians. Of course that is part of what we're doing here. Uh, very quickly I would also like uh, the viewer out there to, to them, if you've been watching the, the Executive Secretary just reference the fact that he has hearing impairments, but I mean, he is here and he is a testament of just how much uh, persons with disability can contribute to national development. Uh, Executive Secretary, in terms of public representation and governance, the mandate is to have at least 5% of all public appointments go to people and persons with disability as backed up by the law establishing uh, the, the, the commission. Uh, the argument is that only persons with disability can provide solutions to challenges that they face. Is that what you personify as Executive Secretary of the Commission? Uh, and I reckon, well, it, it might be a good start, but I, I reckon you, you need more to fill the 5% uh, public appointment mandate. <coughs> thank you, thank you so very much. In this matter of 5% employment opportunities, there is 5% for appointment opportunities in the public, in political appointment windows. There is another 5% for the employment of persons with disabilities in the civil service across the federation. What I want to tell you is that there are some certain individuals, some certain governors that we need to appreciate them for this wonderful effort in providing a political appointment for persons with disabilities that is inclusive governance and practice. Okay. When you look at his face, President Mamadou Buhari remained the first ever president in the history of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to recognize the disability community and provide political appointments as senior special assistant to the president on disability affairs and special assistance to persons with disabilities to the president. These are special assistants that have already been appointed even before the establishment of the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. And today, by the future of the establishment of the commission, there are another other six appointees, including the executive secretary making seven political appointees at the, at the commission level to make sure that persons with disabilities are included. When you look at the governor of Plateau State, his excellency Professor Mbakolalong, he did his best. All the 70 local governments, he gave appointment for persons with disabilities. When you look at the governor of Oyo State, he did a wonderful job in the area of appointment for persons with disabilities. The governor of Kano State, he also do a very wonderful thing in providing appointment for persons with disabilities. You you go to Lagos State, there is a problem for persons with disabilities. In a number of states, there is a special assistance to persons with disabilities. You go to other states in Inugu State, there are also political problems for persons with disabilities. So when you look at this, these mm. governments are trying. Okay. We cannot say completely that they are not trying, they are trying. But we are moving up our advocacy to see that that 5%, we reach that level of that minimum of 5% so that we can be able to expand this. When you come into the employment sector, employment into the civil service, we have already started this. Okay. Now, effort to ensure the 5% employment opportunities are covered within the federal civil service is that we have already constituted a technical working group. This technical working group includes the Federal Civil Service Commission, the Federal Character Commission, the Office of the Head of Service of the Federation, and then the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation. When you look at this, we also have the House of Representative Committee on Disability, and then the, House, the Senate Committee on Special Duties. These are all the teams that constitute this very important technical team so that we can advocate and move further. The Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation has also met everything clearly. We saw the passion demonstrated by the Secretary to the government of the federation when you order for a service wise circular to be released. The service wise circular is supposed to complement the implementation of the discrimination against persons with disabilities prohibition act to try to bring all the federal institutions to comply with that section 29 of the act 
to make 5% employment opportunity for persons with disabilities. Okay. Right now, as I'm talking to you now, this team that have already been constituted have also got some international organization to support this system. So Fantastic. the team are going to visit the city of political zones to go and meet with all the chief executive officers of federal government agencies and parastatal, including the office of the head of civil service of the different state governments. We are going to meet with them to create the necessary awareness in them and make sure that the compliance to this act is total and complete and it goes down to the state level so that all of these places will provide opportunities for our own people. That's, that's fantastic and, I mean, good to hear. Uh, and since you raised the issue of compliance, I would like to talk about something on compliance. And it's actually about environmental friendly practices for PWDs. I would like to talk about public transportation, for instance. The freedom to move safely around urban and rural areas in Nigeria is greatly restricted by the plan and design of transport systems that is, well, not absolutely, but near absolutely insensitive to the needs of PWDs. I know it's early days yet for the Commission, but what structure do you ultimately have in, in mind that you would like to put in place? And do you think it's achievable within three to five years or even less? Thank you, thank you so very much. In this question here, two things are involved. Accessibility to the physical environment as well as accessibility to transportation system. Let me deal with this issue of transportation system. The issue of transportation system, when you look at our present railways, mm. there are challenges. Okay. When you look at our airport, there are challenges. When you look at our motor parts, there are challenges. And when you look at this, it is a very, very capital intensive project. Mm. And we are committed to make sure that through the right partnership with the right agencies of the federal government, we are going to address this. We are, I want to say a very big thank you to His Excellency, Right Honorable Rotimi Amiachi, the Honorable Minister for Transportation. This is a minister that showed passion for disability. We saw the challenges in our railway. He said that his ministry are going to correct this. Mm. He saw the challenges in some of our own areas, most especially in our motor parts and other transportation system. The minister have made total commitment to see that these challenges will be corrected. When you look at this, this is something that we have already started partnership. And therefore, we were able to meet with the giant Chinese construction company that is constructing our airport and this mm -hmm. our railways. We sat down with them to really when we identify the challenges to them, they deeply apologize and that they are going to make the necessary correction. This thing will have to make, will take some time for us to be able to start benefiting from it. Okay. Accessibility, when you look at this effort, when you enter railways, our railways, the Ministry for Transport has made some very, very important contribution by allowing our transportation into the railways to be almost 50% discount for the disability community. We are partnering with them to make sure that this opportunity is not abused by some people who will go and pretend disability to benefit from <laughs> that. Because once this are done, yeah, there what? will be always problems and challenges. Because the commitment of this National Commission for Persons with Disabilities is to ensure that at the end of it, some everybody will wish to become persons with disabilities. But time shall tell. Our effort in the area of aviation, there, is, there was a public hearing that was done at the House of Representatives. We invited all the airlines to come. But unfortunately, most of them couldn't come. We wrote letters to some of them to tell them the challenges our people are facing in their own airlines. They should show us these policies. They continue to discriminate against persons with disabilities. If you have a policy and there is an act of the National Assembly, you have to make sure that you correct your policy to go in line with the act of the National Assembly. Exactly. I am not a lawyer, but in every principle, in every policy or laws, there is most always a superior one. There 
therefore, this one here, they must make sure that they ratify all these their policies. So I, that they will I, I have to the come in here, of uh, uh, um, yes, because we're fast losing time. Uh, so I'll, I'll just no, come no, in no, here. No, and no. very quickly, uh, I'd like for you to talk about other areas where you want to see changes as well. I, I know you've you. resumed, or rather you've started an advocacy on land and property mm -hmm. developers. I mean, factoring in, in special needs of persons mm -hmm. with disability in their building plans. Uh, um, I'm not just talking about ramps and walkways here. Yeah, I know th there'll be more. Uh, can you t quickly tell me about that very quickly? Thank you so very much. You see, accessibility, accessibility to housing, accessibility to physical environment is a very, very sensitive issue. And therefore, one of our beginning efforts here is, first, we are currently working. Our okay. procurement process is moving, and we are currently working to see how we can be able to develop, first, the minimum accessibility standard for Nigeria. Then we are going to amend the National Building Code okay. to make sure that we factor in the needs of persons with disabilities into this National Building Code. Again, when we do this one, we are going to provide the necessary policy background that are going to be checkmate to make sure that all buildings henceforth to be consulted must be edited, must be screened by the Disability Commission from the design level before we go for that. Again, but if our effort to make sure that persons with disabilities benefit in yeah. the National Housing Fund program of the federal government, okay. we have partnered with the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria. We have also partnered with the Federal Housing Authority of Nigeria. All of these, my agency, we have went on a tour of some of these federal housing programs in the federal computer territory. Year. Our program with them is that at the start level this year, and by the grace of God, we are going to achieve at least a minimum of 100 houses for mm. persons with disabilities in the 36 states, including the FCT, mm. to make these houses available for them in the most accessible, affordable means. F fantastic. Uh, finally, yes, before I let you go, uh, well, we we're still reeling from the impact of COVID-19, and uh, one of the vulnerable segments is people living with disability who, who already face realities and difficulties in Nigeria uh, even before COVID-19. <coughs> uh, I've heard about the post-COVID-19 um, intervention grant and national cash transfer uh, capturing 50,000 PWDs in the first phase. Uh, is that the start of an inclusive response to limit the impact of COVID-19 on Nigeria's disabled community? But please tell us um, a bit about that and, and quickly too. Thank you so very much. This is another area that we must appreciate. What I call her the mother of persons with disabilities in Nigeria. The Honorable Minister Hajia Sadia Umar Furu for this wonderful and large heartedness <laughs> by granting approval for the 50,000 window for persons with disabilities. This is just the beginning. When you look at this, in the Empower National Empower program, 40,000 opportunities have also been provided for persons with disabilities. For these 50,000, for this conditional cash transfer for the post COVID 19, we are currently collecting the data across the 36 states of the federation to okay. make sure that we bring in this. If you will remember that in 2013, there was a program by the Central Bank of Nigeria that 220 billion naira, medium, small, and small and medium enterprise development fund. When you look at that phone in that village, there was a little problem that the program was hung. Mm. Because 2% of that phone, that is about 4 point something billion naira is supposed to go to persons with disabilities. So in this case, we have written to the Central Bank of Nigeria to revive that program. Okay. Because of the challenges of our people are facing in this post-COVID-19 era, we want to bring back that program so that we will come to help to cushion our this. We will appreciate them for their show of love and concern to the disability community. And we are going to bring all hands together, bring all hands together <laughs> to make sure that we make persons with disabilities feel at home and comfortable in Nigeria. If, if there's Thank anything I doubt, um, Executive Secretary, it, is, it will definitely not be your passion. Because what I see is passion and I, I mean, if this carries true with your mandate and work, I, I want to think it will be better times for uh, Nigeria's disabled community. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on, on the program. I mean, we can only pause this conversation here yeah, now, but this is an ongoing conversation and it would, we will continue to talk about this, I can assure
tell you. I, I would, we'll try and create um, another platform for, for you to come back to this program so we can discuss some more. Uh, hopefully, that will be sometime real soon. Uh, Executive Secretary, National Commission for Persons with Disability, um, James Lalu. I want to thank you so much for coming on the program. You are most welcome. It is our duty. I, I would thank also, you so very much. I, I would also, I would also like to thank our sign language interpreters. There are actually two of them, like I said, but you can only see Timothy uh, Tinap on the screen. There's actually another one behind the cameras also participating <coughs> in, in, in this program. Gentlemen, I would like to thank both of you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And that's it on this episode of the program. Do join us same time next week for more on Insights. I'm Anamdi Ojiko. See you next week.